Romans 4, starting in verse 1. We'll look at the first uh, eight verses first, and then we'll look at the, the last handful of them. So Paul says here, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Now Paul, following up chapter 4, is maybe a somewhat unfortunate break because a new chapter doesn't necessarily denote that we're moving on to something else. He's really continuing with what Adrian preached about just before Easter, this idea of what, where, where does boasting come in then? Based on how God's provided our salvation, what room is there for boasting? And, and he answered that question for us. There is none. It's, it's all eliminated. And now he's going back to use these Old Testament illustrations to say, let me show you where boasting came in in Abraham's life. And you're going to look at David's life. And he's saying, what shall we say then was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Meaning according to his own life, his, his personal, what he did in his own strength. He said, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So he shoots that down. Abraham has nothing to boast about, even though the Jewish people of that time or the religious people would have seen him as the pinnacle of a spiritual father. And yet, Paul's saying he had nothing to boast about in his works. And then he goes on to tell us what was true. He says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So he quotes uh, Genesis chapter 15. We're going to read that in the context in just a minute. But we, the, a key word is, is introduced in this section right there. If you have your Bibles open right now, the, the word counted or credited to or is accounted to might be how it said. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. This is a term we're going to see eight times in our short section. It's an accounting term. Like you use in a marketplace where I'm crediting this to you or I'm, I'm taking this charge off of your, you know, your account. And it tells us a little bit about how God brought about salvation in our lives by crediting something that wasn't ours to our account. You're going to see this term throughout it. He says, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift but it is due, as is due. So Paul's contrasting two ways of thinking. The one who works for it, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as is due. But he says, and to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted or credited as righteousness. So he's contrasting these two mindsets that we still face and adjust today. And he says, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Now he brings up kind of your second key Jewish figure, King David, who is thought to be the greatest king of all the kings. So Abraham the father, David the king, he's using two great examples. And here's what David wrote in Psalm 32 is where Paul's quoting from. David said this, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count or is not crediting his sin. Okay, so here's the first point I want you to see from here, and we'll look at it in, in a couple different ways from Abraham and David's life. The first point God's saying here is God has always saved people through faith in himself. How has God always saved people? He's always saved people through faith in himself, in him. It's not been ever through our works, won't ever be through our works. It's, it's saved through our faith in him. Our ancient spiritual fathers were justified by faith just like we were. They didn't have as much information about God's plan as we do, but it was still because of their faith in him. And, and David, or Paul, uses these two examples in here. So let's read a little bit about Paul or excuse me, Abraham, and then we'll read a little bit about David and kind of connect those two together. So he quotes from Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. But let's read that passage in context to see a little bit about what was going on there and connected in Abraham's life. Remember Abraham? God called him out of his, uh, his own land to come to this new land, and, and then he made some promises to him. And in chapter 15, he's reiterating uh, some of these promises, because Abraham's not sure how it's going to happen. Abraham and, and his wife Sarai, or Abram at this point, had no children, and yet God told him he was going to make him a great nation. He was going to uh, have a great land for him, and uh, he would become the, a blessing to many, many nations. 
through him. And so this is years later, and Abraham still hasn't had a child. And so it says in verse 1 of chapter 15, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. This is God speaking to him. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, meaning one of his servants. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Here's what's interesting about the passage. This is right before the passage that Paul quotes. God hasn't asked Abram to do anything yet. All he's done is told him what he's promised to do for him. And Abram's response to God's promises in verse 6 is this. And he believed the Lord, and he, God, counted or credited it to him as righteousness. That's the passage that Paul quotes from in our passage today to show that that's the point, at least that's what we see, where his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Faith in a promise that was to come, a promise that Abram didn't even fully know the fullness of what it meant. He only know, knew who it was from. God had said, through you, Abraham, I will bring a blessing to every nation. Abram saw about as far as his own son, his physical heir. But God saw through that heir to a greater heir, a greater son, that was going to be the redeemer and, and one who would, who would pay for the sins of all of mankind. So even though Abram didn't know the fullness of the details, he still believed in the God who promised to carry out his promises in his life. And it was through his faith in God that his righteousness came about. See, this justification, in, in a sense, involves a double crediting. A positive crediting like this one where his, he was credited to him as righteousness. But David gives us an example of kind of negative accounting, you could say, taking some things away. And David puts it this way when Paul goes down to his passage and says, uh, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin." You see, in our salvation, there's a, a, a couple kinds of accounting that are taking place. One is our sins are being credited to someone else. That person is Jesus Christ. Our account goes on to him, and he paid for it in his death. And his righteousness is being credited to us now as a result. So all of this is a, a, a type of an accounting that comes through faith. It's believing that God did that for you and for me. And that he is true to his word. That's the heart of justification by faith in what's going on. For Old Testament believers, it, it was giving them credit as they believed in God and his promises, knowing that he was going to pay for their sin through some future sacrifice. They may not have known the fullness of that, but their whole worship system kind of pointed to it. Either way, they weren't trusting in that animal that they sacrificed or anything else. It was just symbolic of the God whom they were trusting in to take care of their sin and to make them righteous before him. They looked forward to that time we have the blessing of looking back and seeing it having historically taken place so how is god always saved god is always saved by faith in himself we know more about him throughout time but it's always by faith in himself the second thing we see in this passage is who god has always saved who is he always saved well in the middle of this passage we just looked at are two verses that contrast the common mindsets or the two possible mindsets Verse 4 says this, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. So the person who works, they've earned what they've got. And it's not a gift anymore. It's credited as something that was due to him. They earned it. But that's not how salvation comes. 
The Bible makes it very clear that salvation does not come through work. In fact, the previous chapter makes it very clear when it says no one, uh, no one will be justified by works of the law. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 will bring up as well. Look at this passage and how it clearly captures this concept of salvation by faith when Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves or not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Salvation is very clearly a gift. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. You either receive it by faith or you don't receive it. That's what Paul is saying. And there's two mindsets that exist in our world. Either the one who thinks they can work for it and they're receiving something, they're going to receive their due. But Paul said that the wages of sin is death for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He's already made that case. So what he's saying here is that, hey, you can't work for this gift. And then he goes on to verse 5 and says uh, in that same passage in chapter 4, and to the one who does not work, See, that does not work, but look what he says here. But believes in him, meaning God, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So believing in a God who justifies the ungodly, that's what the qualification uh, for salvation, is trusting that God's promise is that I'm going to save those who are ungodly. Those who think they got it all, they're going to work on their own works, their own measures, and they're going to get what's to do them. And Paul said what that was. But those who believe that God justifies the ungodly, their faith is counted as righteousness. So here's our second one, is who God has always saved. This is the type of person God has always saved. God saves those who trust that he saves the ungodly. God saves those who trust that he saves the ungodly. You see, a saved person does not trust in their obedience as a way to be saved. They know that it's a gift. They know that it's not something they can earn. It doesn't mean they don't obey. They're just not trusting in their obedience as a form of salvation. In fact, saving faith is simply this. This is the heart of saving faith. Saving faith is the transfer of your trust from something or someone who you think can save you to the only one who truly can. That's what saving faith is. It's a transfer of your trust. Some of us tra trust our good works. Some of us trust you know, our good accounts or our background or our family heritage or some of us trust our religious practices. Some of us trust our good looks. Some of us don't have an option of trust in that. I'm just saying. But we all trust something. And what you are trusting for that determines the outcome. You see, faith is not an alternative to righteousness. Faith is the means by which you receive it. It's not a work in and of itself. So I want to give you some typical statements. Here's things I hear all the time, real common, and we probably have all been here uh, in terms of how we know whether we're saved or when you ask a person hey are you saved are you going to be in heaven with god how do you know that here's three of the most common types of phrases that i'll hear and i want you to understand these are types uh, of non-saving faith this is non-saving faith but it's one of the most common things that you'll hear when you ask people here's the first one these are going to come up on the screen uh, how do you know you're saved well because i have tried my best to be a good christian how do you know you'll be with God forever? How do you know you're, you're right with him and, and you're going to be with him forever? Well, because I've tried my best to be a good Christian. That's called salvation by works. What's the salvation of this person based on? How hard they've tried. It's not what the Bible says. The second common uh, type of non-saving faith is this, a statement like this, because I believe in God and try to do his will. I believe in God and I try to do his will. That's why I'll be saved. That's why I think I'll be with him. Again, this is called salvation by faith plus works or belief plus works, you might say. It's believing in, in a God, but it's ultimately saying, but I'm working really hard. I'm trying really hard to do his will. Again, another very common one, but it's not a, a saving type of faith. Here's the third one, and this is maybe the most deceptive one, one that's become really common in a lot of churches and it's 
you, 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 I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but this is the one that's real common. Because I believe in God with all my heart is a common sage or something like that. Again, emphasizing how great your faith in is or how much you have of it. And that's salvation by faith is my work. See, here's how messed up we are as people. Even if we know that salvation is by faith, we'll somehow make faith a work so that we can then take credit for it. And here's, here's I, can, I can pick these people out so quickly because you know what they talk about more than anything? Their faith. You know, I had faith for this and God, God did this miracle. And they might be, you know, they, they tend to talk a lot about God's miracles, which there's nothing wrong with that. But even in your conversation about God's miracles, you never sense that God's really the center of the conversation. It's how much faith they had to get God to do what he did. They tend to judge people, well, if you just had enough faith, then you'd get this too. And, and all, the whole conversation sounds spiritual, but it's all, again, it's on themselves. It's building them up in their faith rather than true faith has a humble recognition that if were it not for the beauty and glory and goodness of God, I would have nothing. True faith thinks less about yourself and more about God doesn't mean you think less of yourself it means you think about yourself less and you think about him more let me give you an example of why this is uh, such an important thing to understand and, and how we often fall into it this this comes to light as i mentioned this type uh, when we are always talking about the amount of faith we have and making that uh, the basis of our salvation and that's not to say that there is a difference between little faith and big faith there is I don't want to diminish that. But in terms of our salvation, that's not the place to have that measure. So let me help you understand that the key to saving faith, and it's not the amount of faith, but it's the object of your faith. And let me give you a little illustration that maybe will capture that. Let's say two people are getting ready to load onto a, a plane, a 747, big 747 jet, and it's going to be taking off from Dallas and flying all the way over the ocean and landing in London. Okay, and one of the passengers, uh, she's flown that flight, you know, dozens of times, does it all the time. Almost every month she has to make that flight. And so, you know, it's not even a big deal for her. She just gets that ticket, hops on the plane, pff, we're gone. I, I have no doubt we're going to get there. But the, the other passenger, uh, he's never flown before. In fact, he grew up in a teeny tiny little town in Texas, in a little ranch, and, and rarely ever left the region where he was born and has lived. And for the first time, he's stepping foot on this huge plane and flying over this vast ocean. And he's used to just having his feet planted on the ground. And he is scared to death. In fact, sitting, waiting for that plane to board, he's, said, he's, he's four times he's thought, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm not doing this. There's no way. And he's had to convince himself to stay. And after they called his you know, boarding at time, he skipped that one, he skipped the second one, skipped the third one. They're at final call, and he's just going, oh, I don't know that I can do this. And he just musters up enough courage, enough faith to shimmy his way down into the plane. Guess what? When that plane lands, both of those passengers will be in the same destination in terms of where they were going. The woman with total trust in the plane and the man who just had enough to shimmy his way down and get onto the plane will end up in London at exactly the same time. Why? Because in terms of the, the faith, in terms of salvation, it's not about how big your faith is. It's not about how much faith you have. It's about the object in which you place your faith. And if that object is reliable, whether it's teeny tiny faith that stepped you across it or a huge faith, which usually doesn't happen with the first person with it as you start that journey, it's, it's irrelevant. The object is what determines whether the outcome will come. And that's what Paul's talking about. He's not trying to say that, that, that small faith and big faith are exactly the same and it doesn't matter how much faith. That's not what he's trying to say. We'll talk about that later on in this book. In fact, here's a simple illustration just to calm your minds because most of you, I'm going to lose you at that point because you're going to have arguing about the size of faith the rest of the time and you're going to miss the rest of the point of the message. So let me just put you at ease. 
Faith and the amount of faith is important. But it doesn't make a difference in terms of the outcome of the one whom that faith is in. That what it does make a difference is, is how much of who he is you're going to fully experience and enjoy on your journey. That woman who totally trusts that plane, she's going to be walking up and down the aisles. She's going to enjoy every single benefit that plane has. She's going to be able to engage with people, talk with them, interact with them, maybe even influence them because she's totally trusting that that plane's going to get her and take care of her on the way. Whereas that guy that barely got on there, he's going to be clinging to his seat cushion because he knows, I know this thing's going down and I'm hanging on to this thing no matter what until I get there. Okay, both of them are going to end up there because their faith was in the right object. But the quality of their life could be very different in the journey if they learned to fully trust all that that plane had to offer. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about salvation at this point. He's going to get into those other aspects as we get into chapter 6 and on. But it's so important we understand this truth first, and Paul spends so much time laying that down, because when he gets into challenging us to obey and follow Christ and even lay down our lives for us, for him, he's, he wants us to know you're not laying it down in order to save yourself. That's a done deal. You're laying your life down. You're obeying him because he's already saved you, because you're coming to understand more and more the depth of his love for you. And the only natural response to a God who has done what he has done for you and me is to offer our lives as a living sacrifice for him. So that's the point that we'll get to later on in the book, but right now he's just establishing this aspect. It's not the amount of the faith, it's the object of the faith when it comes to our salvation. If we don't catch that, if we miss that aspect, we're going to miss out on a big part of what our salvation is. So your point, did I give you your second point? Did I skip it? I did? That God saves those who trust that he saves the ungodly. All right, so let's get to the last part then. Uh, of, of what are the religious practices we're getting we're get over behind. It's been a long service already. All right, I just want you to know I got up here really late today. I think it was uh, how long Eddie's announcements were today, right? It was like, like <laughs> good thing he's not saved by works because he'd be out <laughs> for how much, how much time he took today. Third thing is, where do spiritual rituals come in, okay? And Paul's going to address that in the last few verses. Let's read this quick, and we can get through this really quick, okay? He says, then, is this blessing then only for the circumcised? Meaning, you might put it as the religious. For them, it was the Jewish people. If you didn't follow these Jewish traditions, is, are they the only ones that get this blessing then? Or also for the uncircumcised? So he's asking that question. He says, for we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? Meaning, was it before he uh, obeyed in this spiritual ritual or after he obeyed in it? And he says it was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. You can go back and read that in Genesis. Well, the passage that Paul quoted from is in Genesis 15. Abraham doesn't get circumcised till several chapters after that. It was credited to him as righteousness before he ever went through a religious ceremony. Okay, and then he tells us the purpose here. He says the purpose, why did God do it in that way? The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised, or the Jewish people, who are not merely circumcised, because we're looking here now, it's not just those who are, are circumcised, not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had. What was Abraham's faith? His faith was in a God who saved him and made him righteous, not in his own works. So he, what he's saying is that, hey, you can go through the religious ceremonies, but those aren't the ones that, that Abraham's the father of. It's those who, yes, do those ceremonies, but they do them because their faith, they walk in the same kind of faith that Abraham had, a faith that God is the one who provided for their salvation, not these works or these rituals that they went through to provide it. 
And he said that he had before he was circumcised. So here's your final point. God calls those who are already saved to authenticate their faith through spiritual rituals. God calls those who are already saved to authenticate their faith through spiritual rituals. I love this quote by one commentator who is speaking on this passage. He said this. He said, a Christian is one who stops working to be saved, but does not stop working. A Christian is one who stops working to be saved, but not one who stops working. See, Abraham was justified before he obeyed God's command for circumcision. And his faith, because of that, makes him the model for all people, whether you're circumcised or you were in that Jewish faith or you weren't in it. His is the model. Trust God's provision for your salvation. As Christians, we're called to authenticate our faith as well uh, through some similar things, things like the Lord's Supper that we celebrated today, things like baptism. Those were the two common rituals that Jesus called us to celebrate on a regular basis. Not to save us. These aren't means of salvation. Neither one of these things can save you. You could do them a hundred million times. And it will do nothing for you in terms of placing you in a right place with God. Only Jesus can do that. And each of these, just like circumcision, point to him. Circumcision pointed forward to the Savior that would come. God said he will come through your people, Abraham. And Abraham believed forward for him. But these point back for us. Baptism that Jesus lived, we're standing up when we get baptized, that he died, was buried, and he rose again. And Paul says you are being identified with him in that. The Lord's Supper again points to him, that it was his body, it was his blood that was offered for you and for me. God wants us to know that these ceremonies, yes, they're important, yes, they're significant, but they are not the means by which we are saved. They point to the only one who truly could save us. And his righteousness is credited to your account and my account when our faith is in him. Not when it's in these things or these practices. See, a failure to understand or believe this leads to two extremes in our lives. One is an insecurity or a lack of assurance. It's discouragement. Our salvation, or we feel confident or secure in Christ as long as we're performing well. And when we have those bad weeks, which everyone does, we begin to doubt that God could save anyone like us. That's when we should be the most confident. Because Paul said here, God saves those who trust that he justifies the ungodly. Man, never are you in a better place than when you recognize just how ungodly and broken you are. And at that point, when you stop and say, where where is my trust right now? Man, it's not in me. I'm too much of a mess. God, thank you that you provided a sacrifice for me. then there's those weeks when things are going great man you've attended bible study you even read your bible that week and you went to church and you've done some kind deeds for people and and if you're thinking that those are the things that saved you do you know what tends to happen is you start to think a little too highly of yourself you start to look down at those who didn't have as great a week as you did And, and and churches can be built like that is these are the super religious people and these are the less religious people and, and suddenly you get this big control thing going on, this big pride thing going on and churches and religions are built around this. Religious people love that mindset because it keeps them in control. It allows them to look better than the other people. That's why they hated Jesus in his day. The religious people knew that if, if people were justified by faith, then then we lose all control over them. And so they put him to death. Spiritual pride is absolutely the other end that this will lead to, even in Christian churches. Only when you believe that you are
are justified by your faith in him and he credits that righteousness to you to the ungodly he credits it will you have both humility and confidence humility because you know how much you need him confidence because your salvation is absolutely secure in him imagine a church this truth and and proclaim this truth to a community that desperately needs to hear this. A community riddled with spiritual pride, with spiritual brokenness, with spiritual tears and levels and and works and and means to earn your salvation and, and all kinds of people who are enslaved to a mindset that will never help them understand how secure they are in Christ if they would just trust him as their Savior. Imagine what your life would be like, how how much less sensitive you'd be to criticism if you knew you were secure in Christ. How much more humble you might be toward how you approach others. How much differently you would see people around you. How much less discouraged you get when you have a bad week. And how more much humbler you would be when you have a great week. That's what these truths are about. They're at the heart of who we are as Christians. And I pray that they continue to transform us.